Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. Well, good day to you, brothers and sisters. Going to show you something cool as always. In this lesson, I want to prove to you why the New King James Version is the best version to use when you are studying eschatology. When you're trying to understand the second half of the last seven years of the age, and you're trying to decide whether the day of the Lord begins at the appearing of Jesus Christ, or does the day of the Lord begin much earlier when Father begins to chastise his people prior to the appearing of Jesus Christ. In other words, the uh, time known as the time of Jacob's trouble, that promised curse um, you know, of Deuteronomy 32. So when does the day of the Lord begin? Well, this is why you need to use the New King James Version to study eschatology. All the versions are great, at least the, the majority of them. They're awesome, and I love the King James Version. But I'm telling you, this is even better, and I'm going to prove it to you, uh, that this version, New King James Version, when studying eschatology, is even better than the King James Version. And you'll see why in this short lesson. Uh, I could use many uh, books of the Bible to prove this, but I want to keep this lesson in well under 20 or 30 minutes. So let's just simply use Isaiah chapter 13. And after this lesson, you know, when you're going to get it down, how the New King James Version describes the day of the Lord in the, at three different phases. Did you know that? Sometimes I say two, but there's actually three different phases to what we call the day of the Lord. You're going to see that in this lesson. So let's use Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13 is all about the latter days. In fact, uh, Isaiah 13 is the match to Revelation 17 and 18. This is the fall of Baghdad, Babylon, the great city. Uh, we're not going to go over the entire chapter, but I want to show you something. Let's look specifically at verse 9 and verse 13 here in Isaiah 13. Uh, again, here we are in the New King James Version. And right here we begin seeing... Um, the phases of the day of the Lord. Okay, it starts out by saying, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, with both wrath and fierce anger. Now, if you just read this by itself, you would say, well, this pretty much matches all the other versions. It's just simply saying how bad it's going to be and how upset Jesus is going to be when he musters his armies for battle in Revelation 19 on the last day of the age, and he comes against his enemies. And at first glance, that's exactly what it looks like. But I'm going to prove to you that this is actually talking about phases to the day of the Lord. And what you're going to see in this lesson is the day of the Lord begins when that first trumpet is blown. All right. In other words, the uh, scroll has just been opened. If Father has determined by the end of the fifth seal that Israel has failed the test. The whole world's going to get tested, but the fifth seal test, Father's really looking at Israel. Are you going to persecute the poor and needy Christians who are standing on the street corners screaming that Gog the Assyrian, who you are accepting as your wicked prince, is actually possessed by Satan, him and his false prophet, really? So, if Israel fails that test which the Bible alludes to the fact that they, you know, 99% chance that they will, we should be praying for Israel. It would behoove us. But anyways, when the time of Jacob's trouble begins at the first trumpet, those first four trumpets, which are not the three woes, remember? The first four trumpets, when wormwood is being brought, famine and pestilence is being brought upon Israel by father, those first four trumpets are known as the wrath of the Lord of hosts on his people. The three woes is known as the day of um, the day of his fierce anger on his people. That's phase two. That's the three woes. 
fifth trumpet, sixth trumpet, and seventh trumpet. The day of his fierce anger. In other words, it's not just ordinary wrath of the Lord of hosts now. We're talking about the fierceness. Right? The 200 million men are going forth. All right? Baghdad's, uh, excuse me, Jerusalem is being besieged at the sixth trumpet. And then, of course, at the sixth trumpet, you also have 200 million jihadists taking their orders from the Euphrates River, going out to try to convert the rest of the world. And everyone will trying to get people and governments to come under the power, anyone who won't submit to Gog the Assyrian, the final Antichrist. So that's phase one. Phase two, now phase three, is after Jesus appears. And now he is done purging Israel of her dross, her sins, her iniquities, her transgressions. He's cleaned her up. She wouldn't accept his blood atonement, so now she's had to suffer. All right? She's had to shed blood. That's the time of Jacob's trouble, called the time of the Gentiles. That curse and the oath that shall pass over seven times, seven trumpet judgments. So, now at the seventh bowl appearing of Jesus Christ on the last day of this age to start the millennial period, he musters his armies for battle. In fact, you see it here in this chapter in verses 3 and 4. That's what Revelation 19 is talking about, the armies of heaven. Not to mention the mortal armies like the crusaders and the ten kings who turn against the beast, says Revelation 17, and burn her with fire. So Jesus is using all of his weapons of indignation to bring about the fall of the beast kingdom. But again, the three phases are... Of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord does not begin when Jesus appears at the seventh bowl. The day of the Lord begins much earlier at the first trumpet. Or you could actually say even when it's time to don sackcloth at the sixth seal. And the seventh seal is loose. I believe all in the same afternoon. Then boom, here comes um, the hired razor flying the bee army from the north. Father calls it his camp, his army in Joel chapter 2. That blows people's minds. Isaiah 7 and 8, Father says, I'm the one mustering this army to chastise my people. Yes, Gog's going to be possessed by Satan, but I'm still calling it uh, my army, says the Lord. He's the one putting his sword in uh, Gog the Assyrian's hand. He is. So, the day of the Lord begins at the first trumpet. You're going to see it in this lesson. It's called the wrath of the Lord of hosts. Again, use the new King James Version or you'll never truly understand the three phases of the day of the Lord. And then the uh, three woes is the day of his fierce anger on his people. So in other words, all seven trumpet judgments are the chastisement, that rod of anger against Israel. And then you have the Revelation 16, 17's, it is done. That's that it is accomplished. All right. In other words, Israel is done paying for their um, transgression, sins, and iniquities. Father is done purging their dross. The Zechariah 13 should be coming to mind. That's the it is done of Revelation 16, 17. So the first two phases of the day of the Lord is over. Now when Jesus appears... It's still the day of the Lord. All right, and you'll see some passages in the Bible talking about Jesus' appearing, and it's talking about how it's the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord didn't start then. The day of the Lord started uh, back at the first trumpet, or really back at the sixth seal when the Amos 8 timed the dawn sackcloth at, at noonday. Right. They know it's. they have sinned against the Lord, and here comes the, the biggest horde a massive military force known to man coming upon uh, uh, Israel and heading down to take the precious things of Egypt, this pl first plunderer, this first northern army. But yes, the third phase is the day of his fierce anger on his enemies. And it has many other titles as well. All right. So let me quickly show you, using the New King James Version, of how you can prove that um, in this study of Isaiah 13. And, and it's really a study of the wrath of the Lord of hosts and a study of the day of his fierce anger. Now, 
it it can be said, and it is said in Lamentations chapter one, um, that when Jesus is done threshing all the various threshing floors during the battle of the great day of God Almighty, which is the first many days of the millennium, Isaiah 28 says it lasts for many days. Um, Lamentations 1 says it will. the Lord will also say it is done at the end of that. So you have a it is done at Revelation 16, 17, the end of the sixth trumpet, excuse me, the end of the sixth bowl. Father says, I'm done. I'm done spanking my children. Now, when I Jesus comes at the seventh bowl, yes, you better believe it. He's going to be blowing fire, purifying Jerusalem. He's going to be making sure all the tares found within the borders of Israel are killed. Of course, they're going to be killed throughout the whole Middle East and maybe the world. But, but there's still going to be plenty of fire coming upon Israel. That's why Jesus has to um, let the foolish virgins who are unmarked, but they're not glorified, escape through the mountain valley pass of the Mount of Olives over to Bethany, Azal, 2.5 miles east. Hide yourself for a little moment until the indignation has passed. What indignation is that talking about? That wrath of the Lamb, the third phase to the day of the Lord, the day of his fierce anger on his enemies. You know, that's that uh, um, uh, for, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, Zephaniah 1, 18, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on all those who don't believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ and who just spent many, many months shedding the innocent blood of followers of Jesus Christ. So three phases. Uh, we get our first uh, introduction to it here in verse 9 of Isaiah 13. Again, Isaiah 13 is all about um, Jesus appearing and destroying Baghdad, Babylon, the great city, which will be the headquarters of the beast kingdom. Now, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. But, verse 9 is letting you know that there's more than one phase to the day of the Lord. And you may say, well, brother, that didn't quite prove it. No, by itself it didn't. Now, when you get down to verse 13, Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and, and, in the day of his fierce anger. That and is important, and it should be there, okay? This is um, telling you that there's two different phases. But this day of his fierce anger is talking about the day of his fierce anger on his enemies. But Lamentations 1 will see that the day of the Lord or the day of his fierce anger, um, is also the three woes of the chastisement. It'll make more sense when we go to Lamentations 1. All right, so we have multiple phases to the day of the Lord, but this is talking about the wrath of the Lord of hosts on his people. And if you want to get real specific, that's, that's probably alluding to the entire time of Jacob's trouble. In other words, it's not differentiating between the first four trumpets and the last three trumpets. It's just grouping them all under the title of Wrath of the Lord of Hosts. But when you get to passages like Lamentations 1 and Isaiah uh, 9, you see that the, if you really want to get specific, the first four trumpets are the Wrath of the Lord of Hosts, and the last three trumpets are the day of his fierce anger on his people. But this day of his fierce anger is talking about the fall of Babylon. That's what this chapter is all about. Now we're talking about the day of his fierce anger, the wrath of the Lamb, against his enemies. Again, that's Zephaniah 1.18, um, 2 Thessalonians 1.8. That's that the refiner's fire of Malachi 3, Malachi 4. That's what that is. Uh, do not let Revelation 6, 6 seal passage, confuse you. Because that is describing Jesus' appearing. But the Father has not decided yet when he's bringing Jesus. Does he bring him at the first trumpet or at the seventh bowl last trumpet? 
Now, obviously, if he comes at the first trumpet, the first trumpet is the last trumpet. Right. So father will decide at the end of the fifth seal how Israel performed during the first 12 months of the of the 42 months. In other words, uh, Malachi 4 should be coming to mind. It did, was Elijah successful? Was he able to to get to turn the hearts? All right. Of the last generation of Israel to the forefathers, to the teachings of the forefathers, all right, to God, the Holy One of Israel, Yah. Were they successful in explaining to them about the mysteries of God and who Jesus really is? If he's not successful, then Father's going to let the promised curse come as scheduled. That's what's inside of the scroll that's being opened. It's the day of the Lord, but... It's up to Israel to decide before the end of the fifth seal, are they going to do it the easy way or the hard way? The easy way is Jesus comes back. After the seventh seal is loose and the first trumpet is blown, becomes the last trumpet, and it's Jesus. And if they choose the hard way and accept the wicked counselor as their wicked prince and God, the man possessed by Satan, this man that shall arise to power in Mosul, Iraq, says Nahum chapter 1. If they accept him, then the curse is going to come as scheduled. And Jesus will not appear until the seventh bowl. So, wrath of the Lord of hosts and the day of his fierce anger. Again, here it's grouping all seventh trumpets into the wrath of the Lord of hosts title. And in the day of his fierce anger is talking about the wrath of the Lamb after Jesus appears, which is more in line with what this chapter is talking about. Now, how do I prove this, that my understanding is correct and why you should be using a New King James Version to study eschatology? Well, first of all, Isaiah, just four chapters earlier, explained to us what he means by the wrath of the Lord of hosts. All right, and you see that in Isaiah 9. Now, Isaiah 9 is all about the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not about the last day of the age when Jesus appears and renders his refiner's fire on all of his enemies and the enemies of the gospel. Isaiah 9 is all about the seven trumpet judgments time of Jacob's trouble and the punishment on Samaria. Okay, you can read this. We don't have time. Hallelujah. But this, it, it talks about all of this, the, um, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble is the wrath of the Lord of hosts. See, you see it right here. This is all about the chastisement on Israel. This is the wrath of the Lord of hosts. It talks about fire and pestilence and wormwood. Um, you know, all the grass being burned up. This, these are the first four trumpets. Okay, you need to read this for yourself. But I, I brought you here to explain to you what Isaiah is talking about when he says wrath of the Lord of hosts in chapter 13. Nothing here about Jesus appearing and... Uh, destroying his enemies. This is the seven trumpet judgments. So, got it? So that's what Isaiah meant in verses 9 and 13 of Isaiah 13. Even though he's talking about, the chapter is talking about Jesus mustering his armies for battle. Okay, but I, uh, verse 9 and 13 is letting us know that the earth is going to shake a little bit when Gog the Assyrian comes down out of Turkey and out of uh, Assyria. All right, northern Syria, northern Iraq, out of Turkey. Here comes this Assyrian alliance. All right, helping and guarding the children of Lot. Here they come as this rod of anger. They're even coming up, up out of Ethiopia. In Sudan and in the Nile River Basin. Here they come. So that's the wrath of, of the Lord of hosts. Yes, in, in many places in the Bible it says that when Gog the Assyrian comes swiftly and speedily, 
that the earth is going to shake when when he comes upon Israel. So it, it just matches other uh, books of the Bible. That's what's meant by in verse 13. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Now, if you just uh, using the New King James Version, you do a search for wrath of the Lord of hosts. This is what this is what comes up. We were just in Isaiah 9 verse 19. There it is. You see it in Isaiah 13. It's also mentioned uh, in Zechariah 7 and Zechariah 8. Okay, this is the punishment, the chastisement on Israel. You know, this is the Malachi 4 lingo here in Zechariah 8, 14. And I would not repent, relent. From what? Relent from bringing the coming curse promised in Deuteronomy 32 and other chapters of Leviticus and, and Deuteronomy. Okay. That's that promised curse. Time of Jacob's trouble. Time of trouble. Time of the seven troubles of Job, I think, five. All right. Here they come. The curse and oath of Daniel 9, verse 11. The 9-11 passage. All right. That's what's meant by the wrath of the Lord of hosts. So don't confuse that with Jesus' appearing. And it's the day of the Lord. So do not let anyone tell you the day of the Lord doesn't even start till Jesus appears. That's not true. The time of Jacob's trouble is part of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord has three phases. Now what about the day of his fierce anger? If you do a search for that. Okay. And what you'll see is now here is Isaiah 13, where we were. Look at Jeremiah 30. The fair saying of the Lord will not return until he has done it, and until he has performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days you will understand it. Now we know we, in Revelation 16, 17, that loud voice comes before the throne just before Jesus is brought by Father on the last day of the age. It is done. So, now, which it is done is the Lord talking about here? Is Jeremiah 30 about the chastisement on Israel phase of the day of the Lord? Or is it talking about the fiery coming in uh, flaming fire, rendering his vengeance on his enemies, the wrath of the Lamb? Uh, what is Jeremiah 30 talking about? Well, you go to Jeremiah 30 and we find out that that I will break his yoke from your neck and will burst your bonds. All right, so Jeremiah 30, and you'll see it here, a full end of the nations. This is all about the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So here in Jeremiah 30, this day of, the, uh, of his fierce anger uh, is exactly what Isaiah 13 is talking about in reference to the fall of Babylon. Okay, but this is not the day of his fierce anger, meaning the last three woes of the chastisement of Israel. Okay, but let's come down here to Lamentations 1.12. Again, let's look to see if this day of his fierce anger is talking about the three woes. Or is it talking about the battle of the great day of God Almighty like Jeremiah 30 and Isaiah 13 is talking about. So let's look at Lamentations 1 and try to determine. Jerusalem in affliction. She weeps bitterly. In other words, her Redeemer has not come. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. Judah has gone into captivity. All right. Her enemies prosper. Now see, this is why I said that Lamentations 1 is all about the time of Jacob's trouble. Hopefully I didn't get that confused earlier. If I did, I'm sorry. So here we see in Lamentations 1 that the, the day of his fierce anger is the day um, called the time of Jacob's trouble. But more specifically, it's just talking about the fierce 
wrath. It's talking about the three woes. Whereas the wrath of the Lord of hosts is talking about the first four trumpets. Remember Isaiah 13 says that there's going to be some shaking and a quaking when Father brings the curse upon Israel. Here comes the final Antichrist heading south, invading the airspace of Israel. Okay, so uh, we could pretty much end this lesson now, but let's summarize. All right, in Isaiah 13, in the New King James Version, the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the first four trumpets. The day of his fierce anger on his people that you see in Lamentations 1 is fifth trumpet, sixth trumpet, and seventh trumpet. Siege of Jerusalem still going on until the arrival of Jesus Christ. And then we have the Jeremiah 30's day of his fierce anger, which is phase three of the day of the Lord, which is on his enemies. That's Jeremiah 30. All right. So Jeremiah 30 is the battle of the great day of God Almighty. It has many titles, but one of them is the day of his fierce anger on his enemies. You can put that in parentheses. That would be a good way of writing it. Lamentations 1, the last three trumpets, the day of his fierce anger on his people. And then the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the day, uh, uh, wrath of the Lord of hosts is the first four trumpets of the curse, time of Jacob's trouble. So there's actually three phases to the day of the Lord. And you have to admit, when you use the New King James Version, I just proved that there are three uh, phases to the day of the Lord. So stop teaching that the day of the Lord is when Jesus appears. No. You have the days of the coming of the Son of Man. But again, Father hasn't decided for, you know, he hasn't decided yet whether he's bringing the curse. The, now the curse is, is established. It's scheduled. He's already decided to bring it back in Deuteronomy 32, but Malachi 4 and other passages say that he's sending Elijah. There's still one last chance. The door is open. There's no way Father's going to bring the curse at the first trumpet when the, when the scroll is opened if Israel bows a knee to Jesus in mass in front of the Antichrist's face and tells him they rebuke him and say, we belong to Jesus. Father's not going to bring the curse. The only problem is Israel's not going to do that. There's a 99% chance that they won't do that. But he still leaves the door open. But in that case, there'd be no wrath of the Lord of hosts. We just go straight to the day of the Lord's anger on his enemies. You got it? Day of his fierce anger on his enemies. That's the Revelation 16, 17 through 21, that uh, cup of drunkenness, cup of madness that he's going to force the enemies of Israel to drink at his coming. Well, brothers and sisters, I hope this lesson has been a blessing to you. Um, now, let's end this lesson by saying this. If you go to the King James Version, if you go to the New Living Translation Version, and you go to all these other versions of the Bible, it'll make it sound in Isaiah 13 like it's all the same event. It'll make it sound like the way it's worded in verse 9 and verse 13. Okay, go to uh, use your version of the Bible, go to 9 and 13, and there is no way you can differentiate the three phases to the day of the Lord in any other version of the Bible that I have noticed. Now, I please uh, send me a comment if your version of the Bible makes it clear when you do searches on the titles that it uses in verse 9 and verse 13 that there are three phases. If you find a version of the Bible that does that, please let me know. But I haven't found any other than the New King James Version. Again, I love the King James Version, but if you use it, you will not be able to determine the three phases to the day of the Lord. I highly, highly, highly recommend the New King James Version when studying eschatology. Hallelujah. Well, brothers and sisters, I hope this has been a blessing to you, and I can't wait to see you next time. God bless.